Um, and I'm going to move on to the first slide. So um, when speaking about any group, um, it's very important to temper those discussions of the present and history with the reality of human life as being one of both belonging and individual difference. And I'm sure if I asked any of you what it means to be Welsh or to be Christian, you would have a whole different range of ideas, overlap, intersection with each other's answers, but also nuances and different emphasis um, that make your answers your own. Every Jew also answers the question of what it means to be Jewish in their own way and in reference to their lived experience, their family and their communities. Um, this first slide um, is here because I want to start by tackling a fundamental question of who is a Jew, who, what makes a person Jewish? The simplest answer is birth. In the way that um, we talk about birth, we are excluding faith or confessional nature of Judaism as in fact irrelevant to the status of a Jewish individual. Every person with a Jewish mother is considered a Jew by all de Jewish denominations. Some de Jewish denominations have extended that to also patrilineal descent. And it is difficult to accept this tension between viewing Judaism as a religion and Jews as an ethnic group, especially when we consider the context of Christian Europe where faith and choice in this regard are of paramount importance in establishing religious identity, and also as the site of the persecution of Jews as a racial group, which leads to much hesitation and avoidance of the topic of Jewish ethnicity in the post-Holocaust discourse. It's perhaps easier when we pull together pieces of Jewish life as a remnant of civilization or nation, and that first comes citizenship, a right you obtain by birth, then comes the responsibility to that society of which you are part and a member and a religion to which they belong. I've chosen the language of religion as opposed to faith because many, for many Jews, faith is not a prerequisite for religious practice and definitely not to the concept of Jewishness itself. And I picked a photograph of David Baddiel to illustrate the Jewishness of atheism and because he himself discusses the Jewishness and modern anti-Semitic imagery in his book, Jews Don't Count, which I'm sure you may have heard of. Um, Jewish atheism, agnosticism, secularism are not oxymoronic. I could have chosen a picture of Karl Marx, Rosa Luxemburg, Sigmund Freud, because in the Jewish mind, these people are just as Jewish as the rabbi of the local synagogue. In fact, they may represent a cultural Judaism in a profound way, which their rabbi doesn't. <laughs> Um, there are different definitions of a Jewish person according to different denominations, um, but I, I wanted to open with that conversation piece. Um, and kind of flowing from that, when we ask Jewish people how they identify and what makes their Judaism Jewish, most European Jews define their Judaism in more than one way and see no contradiction in doing so. So although the single answer respondents um, chose religion, opted for that option, um, when calculating for multiple answers, 68% mentioned parentage, um, which is more than who mentioned religion. Um, and that differs from dif in ge different geographical locations. Um, so, the report on screen is based on the research conducted in 12 European member states, which together are about 80% of the Jewish population of Europe. Um, as you can see, the language does commonly respond to parentage, religion, ancestry. Um, and furthermore, in areas of Europe where religion played a greater role in post-war life, namely Southern Western Europe, um, religion and ancestry come hand in hand, whereas in Eastern and Northern Europe, closer to influences of the USSR, ancestry dominates over religion. We almost consider the language that we use to describe Jews and Judaism as subject to the host culture in diasporic Jewish history. So the words in Hebrew, the kind of native words, if you will, are Am Yisrael, or the people of Israel, or B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel. In Yiddish, which is also a product of diaspora, the emphasis turns to the people devoid of the land. In Yiddish, we'd say Yidden, just Jews. Um, 
And interestingly, it was the fashion in English for a while to refer to Jews, Jewish people as Hebrews, which is an outdated term, but refers to the linguistic and cultural distinction from Christian neighbours as opposed to the purely religious one. Um, this is this slide sort of talks about how people rate or rank different aspects of really of Jewish life um, and what that means to them. So this was British Jews specifically. Um, no, sorry, European Jews were still on. Um, and it you can see that the implications of European Jewish identity refer much more to their historical and present experience as an ethnic group. So it's subject to anti-Semitism, to the memory of the Holocaust, than to the subscription to Judaism and the belief in God. It's also interesting that both anti-Semitism and the Holocaust are implications of being a Jew in a non-Jewish world and relate to the experience of encounter, not to the selfhood in isolation. So Spain is a fascinating example where the notion of Jewish peoplehood itself constitutes a cohesive identity of Spanish Jewry, um, but it is an exception. So moving on, if we look at kind of ancestry and ethnicity and geography, um, genetic studies have shown that Jews worldwide com have common genetic heritage, which originates in the Middle East, and that they, they, they share a fair amount of that with Gentiles in a similar region. Um, there are different groups of Jews. There are Sephardic Jews um, who uh, who tended to emigrate to Iberia, North Africa, and the Ashkenazi Jews, the European Jews, and then Mizrahi Jews who were um, Middle Eastern and North African. Um, so I've just put a picture here of a couple um, from Sarajevo just to kind of add to what people look like in the context of their own um, geography and um, diasporic experience. Um, so I will move on to Jews of other diasporic groups. Um, I think we're on this slide. Um, we're talking about kind of minority Jewish groups. So most historic Jewish communities were aware of each other and may have even corresponded, traveled to other corners of the globe and encountered one another. But few communities, for example, Ethiopian Jewry, who traveled from the land of Israel after the destruction of the first temple, had cultivated and protected a Judaism that was very different from post second temple exiles. They practiced a non-Talmudic form of Judaism or a non-legal, if, if you want to use that term and appeared to have isolated from mainstream Jewish communities for at least a thousand years. When the state of Israel was established, a rabbinic debate as to their Jewishness ensued. And this form of internal discussion of legal Jewish definitions as to the concept of Jewishness, Jewishness remains fascinating and really problematic to this day. Many commentators also noted the internalized colorism and racism which informed voices on the issues within the wider Jewish community. And before I go to the next slide, um, I want everyone to kind of mentally practice guessing how many Jews are in England and Wales. Um, it's a fun exercise just because there are sort of trends in how many people, um, in how people think Jews are represented and how Jews are actually represented. Um, so if you have that number, a percentage maybe in your head, um, that might help. So the demographics are the total number. Um, this was in 2021, a couple of years ago, it's uh, 271,327, which is 0.4.6% of the population um, of England and Wales. So that's less than half a percent. Um, so I don't, I don't know if people are shocked or if people got it bang on. Um, that's a very small amount. Um, however, Jewish communities tend to build themselves very close together um, in tight-knit communities, often surrounded by the infrastructure that they need. So Jewish shops, Jewish schools, synagogues, um, and therefore they tend to um, be in specific areas. So we're talking London, Manchester, Leeds, Cardiff maybe. So we, you know, that means that lots of people, the majority of English and Welsh people won't come across Jewish people in their daily lives. Um, 
And I also want to point out at this point that while we do talk about Jewish ethnicity and ancestry, there's also Jewish con conversion and conversion is an accepted and normal part of, of Jewish life. It's, it's a small percentage of Jews, um, but there is that kind of uh, gray area between ethnicity and religion that, that Judaism occupies. Um, and it's an interesting challenge. Um, so I think we'll move on to religious life. I think we're ready for that. Um, so when talking about religious life and before we delve into the various Jewish denominations, I feel that I should own up to the fact I'm an Orthodox Jew and I can really only speak to the Orthodox elements of my community firsthand. I can't speak to other denominational experiences. Um, and many people, even within denominations, express their faith wildly differently. Um, some background to denominationalism within Judaism. Um, prior to the Enlightenment and emancipation of Jews in Europe, um, Jewish people believed in practice to different degrees and different ways. However, it was only after these movements um, that Reform Judaism and Orthodox Judaism came to be a framed in distinction to one another. And out of these group, uh, these groups and these movements grew other um, branches. Um, and it's worth noting that non-European Jewry, so Sephardi and Mizrahi Jews, do not have denominations as such and tend to practice what Europeans would describe as Orthodox or traditional Judaism. Um, so I'm going to move through denominations um, quite quickly because there's so much to say and I'm not qualified to say it all. Um, and um, this is an overview. So liberal Judaism, again, it's um, origins in the mid 19th century Germany. And I'm talking in terms of English language for these denominations because liberal Judaism in the rest of the world is referred to as reform Judaism, which is a little bit complicated because reform Judaism also exists in England and it's just uh, not affiliate, well, it wasn't affiliated with um, the wider global reform movement for a while. Um, so, since the 1970s, there's been a movement of inclusiveness, acceptance, in inviting as many people as possible to partake in the community, um, rather than strict theoretical clarity as to Jewish law and to um, Jewishness itself. Um, and it strongly identifies with progressive liberal agendas. Um, in social terms, the idea of tikkun olam, which means healing or repairing the world, and the legacy of social justice found in the prophets. Um, the US is the biggest kind of group of uh, or representation of reformed Jews globally. Um, but there is, uh, and, and here I mean reformed Jews as liberal Jews, um, but there is a strong community in London, in, in England, and um, I'm not sure about the Welsh community, but you can all let me know. Um, we talk about Reform Judaism as separate. It's a little bit more conservative in England than the worldwide reform movement has been. Um, however, in April 2023, so news straight hot, hot off the press, um, Reform Judaism and Liberal Judaism announced their intention to merge into a, signal, uh, a single unified progressive Jewish movement. And that movement will represent about 30% of British Jewry who are affiliated to synagogues. Um, so... That's a sort of breakdown of progressive Judaism. Um, and I'm just gonna move on. So this is Mazorti or conservative Judaism. Now, um, Mazorti in Hebrew, Mazorti means um, traditional. So it's kind of an, uh, a little bit funny, I guess, to think about um, traditional conservative Judaism as on the left of Orthodox Judaism. Um, but what distinguishes Mazorti Judaism from liberal and reform Judaism is its, its definition and its working relationship with halakha or Jewish law, um, which is seen as binding, but also subject to historical development. So there's an ongoing process in which um, rabbinical authorities um, respond to upcoming needs to alter, reform the, the halakha according to existing halakhic processes. Um, and it, it's quite new. It was only institutionalized in 
the mid 20th century in America. And um, it's quite new, but very strong today in Britain. Um, we'll move on. Here I've put, um, this. it's always hardest to talk about yourself. Um, I've put modern um, in brackets, the Orthodox movement um, ranges that there are Jews who define themselves as traditional, uh, modern, um, who might see themselves as yeshivish or like light Haredi, which is kind of a little bit more right wing. Um, but all of these movements are, are related to attempts to synthesize traditional practice and traditional strict adherence to halakha or Jewish law with contemporary science, political issues, the state of Israel, kind of emergence of the 20th century issues alongside um, traditional Jewish practice. Um, and we'll discuss kind of the strict theological distinctions maybe a bit later. Um, the examples of this, so modern Orthodox Jews tend to go to university as well as seminary and yeshiva. So there's kind of the interaction with the outside world is um, is present and, and supported. Um, and now we will move on to ultra-Orthodoxy, um, which can be described as, um, as on the far right of, of the spectrum. Um, so within these communities, it's more common to find less emphasis and engagement with secular education, more traditional gender roles, Yiddish speaking um, communities. Um, and there are two types of ultra orthodoxy. There is um, rational and mystic, um, and they they sort of belong to different groups of thought. Um, and that does impact their theology, but in practice, um, a lot of their social conservatism kind of unites them um so here i have a little very unappealing graph uh, or table if you like um it's definitely a table um of kind of the distinctions between um between the movements um and one of the issues is one of the massive issues is the divinity of torah of the body of law um, that refers to both the books of Moses, prophets, writings, and also oral law. Um, and you can see that the liberal reform movements regard um, the divinity of Torah as, um, well, they regard it um, as questionable or as as non-divine. Um, the conservative Mazzotti movement kind of are, are engaging with the divine notion of Torah, um, but are sort of in a, in a process of change and orthodox movement see the word of god in in the torah and and regard it as divine um and then changeability of halakha is obviously connected to that issue of whether or not human beings have the right or the ability to change the jewish law um in the context in which we live um and conversion is another area that it, it, it causes a lot of um, friction, you could say, which is whether or not um, interfaith marriages are acceptable um, or legal in a in a Jewish sense, um, and how to determine the status of a Jewish person it is is a question in and of itself of great um, um, discussion debate between denominations. So I'll move on now. This is a kind of an example of rabbinic leadership. Um, a rabbi is ordained by another rabbi. It's kind of a process of passing on um, knowledge and therefore authority. Um, only a minority of Orthodox communities accept female rabbis. Um, that's a relatively new kind of concept in the Orthodox world, but that has existed and does exist today in progressive circles. Um, so... Uh, the rabbi doesn't have any divine or or kind of quasi-divine elements. A rabbi is just a knowledgeable person someone yeah. goes to for, they could go for advice, they could go for halachic rulings, legal rulings, um, and they might deliver a sermon every so often. Um, so that that's that. And then we're talking about kind of central texts, um, I've focused on three, so Torah, which is the T in Tanakh, because that's a, an, a, a kind of abbreviation. Uh, the Torah is the five books of Moses, um, 
and that's absolutely central. Um, that's read in portion every every week. Um, and a corresponding bit of prophets is read alongside it. The Tanakh refers to Nevi'im and Ketuvim as well, which are prophets and writings. Um, and they'll be familiar from, from Christian um, liturgy and from Bible and, and the New Testament is um, not included, but <laughs> you'll remember all of these from the Old Testament. So I've also added a page for the Talmud because it's an absolutely central um, text um, for all Jewish denominations, but particularly for those who are focused on halakha, which is um, Jewish law. Um, and if I, if you can see my, I don't know if you can see my mouse. Okay. So what happens on a page of Talmud, if I can be really nerdy about it, you'll have in a central block, a few, a few lines of Mishnah, which is the original, here we go, the original text from 200 CE that was oral, but then written down. And the commentary, the rest of the central text is Gemara, which is the commentary on the Mishnah. These are all written by rabbis, recorded by rabbis. And then around that, you'll have commentary on the commentary. And around that, you have commentary on the commentary on the commentary and references. <laughs> and then at the back of the book, there's an entire um, new set of commentary. So the commentary that didn't fit on the page. Um, that is how <laughs> Jewish law tends to work. Um, and here I have an example of yeshiva or Bet Midrash, which you might have heard yeshiva, I guess, yentl, maybe, you know, cultural references to that, which is a house of learning, which is a place where people study, um, it, traditionally men, but now more so women, um, sit and study um, Jewish law, Jewish text, Jewish philosophy. This on the left is actually my seminary in Jerusalem that I went to for a couple of years. Um, so it's the largest women's seminary in the world. Um, so that's a fun fact. And then <laughs> if we move on to talking about Jewish ritual life and practice, there's a lot to say. So I'm just going to fly through because we're already running out of time. Um, so talk about festivals. Judaism dictates so many areas of life, or it can for a lot of people. And so that includes time, um, laws about time, about life cycle, the Sabbath. Um, and I want to kind of introduce the practical elements. I mean, 80% of British Jews report candles being lit in their homes on the Sabbath, at least occasionally. 61% uh, of them attend a Friday night Sabbath meal. Um, and that is in contradiction to how many Jews actually believe in God. So that's a separate issue, right? Um, so I will move on to other areas. Again, all areas of life. 34% of British Jews believe in God as described in the Bible. So that doesn't mean they don't believe in some form of a higher power or God, um, but as per Jewish theology, 34% of British Jews believe in God. Um, over a third of all synagogue members say they don't believe in God. Um, and 57% of British Jews belong to a synagogue. Um, 63% fast on Yom Kippur, 71% attend a Passover Seder. So these are really important cultural moments as well as ritual moments. Um, and interestingly, 85% of British Jews who have a son have him circumcised. That's a massive number and probably the highest of any ritual activity. Um, and what that suggests to me as a as a Jew is, is that the, the Brits or the the covenant, literally, Brit Milah means the covenant and circumcision. That's how we translate it. It's incredibly important to people. The notion of belonging to the Jewish people that is established through the Brit, through the covenant, um, is seen as absolutely fundamental. Um, and even people who don't believe in God are not affiliated with the synagogue, do not fast on Yom Kippur. Um, that is incredibly important. Um and then a kind of brief look at Jewish history. I think James is going to do a lot of this um, with you guys next week. So I'm just going to move quickly through it. Um, I want to just emphasize the, the. Um, I hope you can't see yourselves in this. I'm just going to move. No, okay, good. Um, I think, 
I chose these images because I want to just show the breadth of, of Jewish experiences um, across the world. So we have obviously the Arch of Titus and the kind of the beginning of exile. Um, so the, the, uh, the celebration of victory over Jerusalem um, and the annexation of Judea. And then we've got um, these two men, Mashiach Gul and Daniel Gul, who are the presence of the Afghan Jewish community in, in the beginning of the 20th century. They've got their picture taken in Jerusalem. And then I've got a picture of some Polish girls um, in Chalm, Poland. Um, and it just kind of to give you an understanding of where we all go and how we all got there. Um, I want to talk about the persecution of Jews in Europe. This is a great map. Um, not because it, it represents something great, but because it is very useful in kind of tracking Jewish movements across Europe when you think about where they were expelled. So areas of expulsion are highlighted in yellow and then areas of resettlement um, that the, I don't know why they did the same color, but the, uh, the words themselves are in yellow. So for instance, my family came from Portugal to Holland to Britain. Um, they came back to Britain after Cromwell let the Jews back in, so it's like the 1640s. That's like my mother's side. My father's side from R Romania and Russia and uh, bordering Poland. So, so many different countries and, and lots of Jews, you know, my great grandparents speak lots of languages because they moved so much. Um, so it, a lot of expulsions were accompanied by, you know, centuries of persecution and things that led up to it, you know, these didn't tend to happen out of the blue. Um, and Poland became a very safe haven. So you can see there's lots of lines to Poland, um, which is why so many Jews lived um, in Poland. Um, of course, James is gonna to talk to you about um, the final solution and the Holocaust. Um, but I also want to bring to light that before the Holocaust, there was a huge wave of immigration to Britain um, because of Russian uh, pogroms. So that's who you can see in the top right hand corner. Those are Jewish refugees in Liverpool. Um, and my, yeah, my great grandparents were Russian Jewish emigres. Um, let's move on. This is about how Jewish people kind of uh, talk about anti-Semitism today. So combating anti-Semitism and remembering the Holocaust have become very important to British Jews over the past decade, more important than they were a decade ago, which is very interesting. Um, that's partly a response. Well, we can translate that information however you want to, but um, I think part of that is a response to what they see as a rise in anti-Semitism. Um, and that's close to a third of British Jews have experienced an anti-Semitic incident. Students are twice as likely to experience um, anti-Semitism. Um, and now I want to talk about Israel because I don't want to leave it out, but um, it's also could be, you know, plenty of presentations on its own. Um, first of all, I want to stress what, you know, who is Israel and what, who are these people? Um, I've got a whole range of immigrants from different places. So we've got Russian Jewish immigrants on the left. We have Yemenite Jews in the middle and we have um, Ethiopian Jews on the right. All of these groups came to Israel um, either during the, the, the kind of first round um, of Aliyot or like a few rounds later um, as a result, either of persecution, usually as a result of persecution, actually for all th three of these groups. Um, so I also want to emphasize that demographically, over half of the Jews living in Israel are Middle Eastern, North African Jews. Um, so European Jews, the Jews that we see all the time because we live in Britain, um, are a minority in Israel. Um, and I just want to move on and talk about the role that Israel plays in, in Jewish life and in Jewish memory. Um, first of all, longing for Zion. I don't want to call it Zionism because that's a very modern political word and has various different connotations. But um, the idea of Zion or Zion um, has been central in Jewish practice, liturgy, messianic literature. Um, 
I mean, we pray towards Jerusalem three times a day. We say a prayer for the return to Jerusalem three times a day. Um, lots of ritual practices end in a call for the for the return to Jerusalem, and it it, re it represents something else as well. It represents a messianic age. It represents unification and uh, restoration, um, and so that is central. Um, and obviously, I put the rivers of Babylon because that's a piece of literature we all know, um, and it's obviously a, a cry for the um, the old days of uh of jewish life in the holy land um and then modern zionism um so it was founded if you can say that it was it was resurrected um in the in the 19th century by secular ashkenazi jews so it's um it was a movement a pragmatic movement that recognized kind of institutional anti-semitism in europe a kind of um a fear that dominated um the the movement that was a response to the Dreyfus affair in France partly um the man on the right Herzl was uh he was sent to cover it as a journalist and he was incredibly moved by the experience um and Jewish programs in Russia at the time as well um really influenced the gravity and the the influence of the movement itself um and with that, I'll move on to kind of modern approaches to Israel and Zionism. Um, so often, uh, often on my social media, maybe, and some other people maybe uh, see kind of uh, what about Jewish anti-Zionism? What is that? Where does it come from? Um, so the Jews on the right, so ultra-Orthodox Jews, believe that while the, the return to Zion is absolutely essential theological conviction, um, it's something that God initiates and is miraculous and spontaneous and is not something within the power of human beings. And therefore, the, the land and state of Israel, as well as being set up by secular Jews, which in and of itself is problematic for them, is also a um, problem theologically. Um, and then, of course, from the political left, um, some Jews believe that Zionism is you know, resembles a European colonial project. It was dreamt up by European Jews. Um, a lot of the initial stages of Zionism could be said to resemble settlement, um, colonization, um, and the appropriation of land, for example. Um, others see that a, a Jewish state, like any religious state, is a problem in the sense that it has a religion. I guess England has a religion, so that would also be a problem. Um, but specifically because it's an ethno-nationalist, um, it refers again to the problem of what is a Jew and who is a Jew, and that could be an ethnicity and therefore innately problematic. Um, so there are criticisms of the modern state of Israel that come from within, um, but it is important to emphasize that most Jews in Britain um, have a strong emotional connection to Israel, um, have family there, have friends there. Um, Although I also want to say that 63% of Jewish uh, British Jews consider themselves Zionists. Uh, 10 years ago, it was 72%. Um, when asked about this uh, or why, you know, people were asked to kind of expand on their answers or if they said, I don't know on the census, they were asked to list why they didn't know. Um, and a lot said, um, commented on the language of Zionism, how but would they feel the word has changed and the meaning has changed and they don't, they don't want to endorse the policies of the current government of Israel, etc. So it's it's a very um, it's a very difficult and tangled issue, um, and these were all, all this polling was done before October the seventh. I just want to emphasize that. Um, so people's obviously people's opinions and feelings may have drastically changed. Um, but this was in the last kind of wave of, of terror and, and of Israel, Israelis response um, was uh, there was a poll and 73 percent of UK Jews felt that um, they were being held responsible in some way for the actions of the Israeli government. 56 percent responded that they felt pub the public and media criticism of the conflict made them feel unwelcome in the UK. Um, and then I kind of want to focus on what do British Jews actually think about Israel and the Israeli government, um, you know, when they're asked to report. 
Um, so this was again prior to October the 7th, things may have changed. Um, although I find these quite reassuring as figures, 79% um, of Jews disapprove of the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and higher proportion proportion disapprove of the Tzalel Smotrich. So I don't know if you're aware of those figures and how much you've been following the news, um, but Israel, Israel's government is the, the most far right government that it's had um, ever. Um, so Jews in Britain are not on board with that <laughs> as a whole. Um, and um, they are pessimistic about the future of a democratic government in Israel, although um, although not as pessimistic as you might think, or as much as they disapprove of, of the government's figures. Um, so, so those are a few figures. I don't want to dwell too much. Again, they're outdated um, and they're generalizations. So that's to be taken with a pinch of salt. Uh, I then want to talk about since October the 7th. Um, the statistics that we have are about anti-Semitism since October the 7th. We haven't got a poll yet of Jewish um, thoughts and feelings about it. Um, but it's definitely something if you're interested in, you can look on the Jewish Policy Research website. They have great research. Um, they do a lot of polling of, of Jews in Britain. Um, and it give you an insight into the community if you want that. Um, these figures are the highest annual totals ever reported to the Community um, Security Trust. Um, the, the figures from the period of September the 7th to December, to the end of December alone, um, are an increase of 589%. So, I mean, they're bigger than entire years that have gone by. Um, so there's obviously a massive spike. Um, and usually there is a spike when there is tension in Israel and Gaza in anti-Semitism, um, but this has been quite monumental. Um, but in at the end of the day, I want to focus on, oops, sorry. I want to focus on the kind of title of the presentation, people, personhood and peoplehood and return to that conversation. Um, so I've chosen these few um, reflections. Um, I want to make sure that we end on a note of Jewish identity and what it means. On the one hand, being Jewish is, is part of being a people and a sense of belonging and connection to a larger identity, culture and heritage. And on the other, Jewish identity is subject to individual experience, to fundamentally changes in social and political environment, a person's relationship with the world outside the Jewish world and their own convictions and beliefs. It's this negotiation between the outsider role inhabited by diasporic Jews and the deep connectivity with the Jewish community and inheritance of a heritage that make a complex expression of personhood. Um, so what makes someone Jewish? Um, the idea of a common denominator is really challenging if we move away from the family tree. Um, the commonality of Jews is perhaps simply that ancestral commonality. Um, but that begs the question, why did Jewish activists, academics, artists cite their Jewishness? Does being Jewish involve some kind of nature or cultural rebelliousness? Um, and that's been a topic of great discussion. And all I can say is that we're all individuals and the substance of Jewish contributions to any area is often diametrically opposed. And what unites them is simply the attempt to contribute. Um, uh, one of the presidents of Israel, Chaim Weizmann, he said, I had a nation of a million presidents. Um, I don't think he meant it in a great way. I think it was, um, we're obstinate and difficult to deal with way. Um, and I think uh, that idea of Jewish audacity or chutzpah is the closest people have come to, to a kind of trait of Jewishness. But I really encourage us to move away from this categorizations um, and think of British Jews as an ethnic minority, a religious group, at the same time, appreciating that those are not the same description. And that most importantly, every Jewish person I know would have comments, edits, and um, disagreements with me about this presentation. <laughs> so I'm hoping you will too. 